it suddenly occurred to me when, when Pietro was talking, if we are, if the idea of modernism is too broad, if we are putting too many things and too many values under one hat, that perhaps we should respect and, and understand that what we refer to as modernism is a lot of different things. We have expression of, of mechanical systems. We have the, uh, the hiding of mechanical. We have the sculptural value. We have the functional values. We have the social ideas. And then we have the, the, the uh, sculptural ideas. I'm just wondering if it helps us in dealing with and, and engaging these buildings to talk about them in, in, in a more specific way for the different types. Do you guys have an opinion on that? I think, I think there are uh, several uh, periods within this period that we frame as modernism. And where does it end? Um, I think uh, I'm tempted to think about the spirit behind the, the kind of attitude towards the um, you, the use of technology to improve the world, which is something that is, uh, in, which was in the 50s and 60s, very different from a situation that we are um, uh, facing now in the world with, uh, as regard to resources and, and, and energy and also, so that, I mean, the technology, has, our, our view to technology is very different today than it was to do then. Um, it's, uh, I, I think, uh, so I think it's always important to think about the ideology also to understand how these works came to be, not just the form of it. And uh, I think, well, it's, uh, I, that's why I tend to put an end to the modern period in Iceland in the early 70s when the 68 generation started to protest against this. Although after that there were buildings produced that were, you could definitely say, are, were in the, using the formal language of modernism. Um, well, I, th I think if we uh, look at how we are building today, I think we are building uh, maybe forms derived from modernism, but without really, in many cases, not uh, with a very different setup. And, uh, and, uh, so I think it's uh, important not to just think, not, not, I think the failure, I mean, we have, to, uh, we have to understand that modernism was an uh, experiment. You know, it was a gr grand vision um, in the beginning and then it became, uh, when the first buildings were realized, like buildings like Villa Savoir turned out to have a lot of technical problems. We have be, uh, that are, that are um, they had very hard time dealing with, with the technology at the time. And uh, now today, it's very easy to build a building like that, but it was very hard in those days. And that the, the, the testing of the first experience of those early works, um, for instance, in the case of Le Corbusier, forced him to rethink his whole way of, of, of uh, using materials and, and, in fact, building, although his principle remained. Uh, so it, I think uh, I, am, I'm, I have a tendency to t stress the, um, the, uh, the fact that I think that architecture is very much an empirical uh, science. It's, a, it's a, the way traditions evolve in, in, in learning. You do something, you t see how it turns out, some things are good, some things are bad, then you t try to do different the next time. And uh, thinking about, uh, you know, the evolution of science, the theories of Thomas Kuhn, the way scientific knowledge has evolved. I think you can also um, apply some of that to, to architectural theory. Well, that has probably been done. I have not read any such books, but maybe, maybe you know. So the question about uh, if these, uh, this method of values, if it helps us uh, or not, I would say that we don't have a choice. We, <laughs> we have to, because uh, time is not standing still. And the values uh, that were based for, for the modernism, 
that was, uh, you could say, that was um, a concept of living uh, that made sense at uh, that time. And uh, it reminds us of uh, something essential uh, as human beings uh, from, from an architectural point of view. Um, the life that is lived uh, among the walls. Um, but we, um, we, we cannot freeze the time and uh, we live in, uh, now on, on a different way. Uh, so we have to. And um, you can say our, uh, our, uh, our concept has changed. Maybe today's uh, concept uh, is, uh, maybe it is sustainability. We've been talking about that for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, which uh, is affecting uh, the way that we live. And um, when we talk about sustainability, there's a, always a cultural dimension. And maybe this cultural dimension that is uh, a superior element of sustainability that can uh, actually more or less guide or rule uh, the normal three others that we, uh, that we discuss. Um, so if we shall not get lost in history and develop our projects, then we we have no other option than to, uh, to work value-based, is my point of view. Are there any questions from the room to begin with? Is there anything you want to add? Then for you, there was a second point that I, was, I started wondering as we were speaking with the idea of, of space, the social space. Um, Peter touched up on it. Um, you've been touching up on it in, in the schools. And uh, Augusta at, uh, in Breitholt and uh, Hjalmar, you, you talked about architects having forgotten them. And I wonder if, if sort of in the same vein of thought, if, if the different modernism at different times was differently concerned about the social space, or if it has always been, a, as, as Pietro was maybe indicating, that always been a, a one of the key factors of it. And then, as Augusta started wondering, is a social space or the, the spatial structure of a neighborhood maybe something that we need to, pro to protect rather than the actual buildings that, that are within that context? What are you guys' thought on, thoughts on that? <laughs> yes, I, th I think, I mean, in many cases, um, these, uh, well, if we can you talk about the Breitholt area, I mean, it's an area that has, as Augusta pointed out, it has certain qualities that were inherent in its original concept but it also has certain uh, uh, downfalls, things that didn't work out. Maybe, mainly, maybe I think the, the idea of the sort of uh, micro-climate, the kind of connection between the, the private unit and the sort of outdoor space which is immediately next to it, and the way that private space is connected to the, uh, the idea of, of communal facilities like the schools and, and so on, uh, that one, that worked very nicely, uh, there were, but then there were other factors that were not so well worked out. I think the, the immediate uh, formulation or the, the, the way the, the center itself was built up was maybe not, is something, it's a component that one could completely rethink in the light of later experience. I think one of the challenges of, of, of Reykjavik planning that Hjalmar and his people are dealing with is um, I mean, we have, um, I mean, uh, I think the approach that he, they have used in the, the harbor is really interesting, this kind of step-by-step step, evolution, doing, not having a very rigid plan, but sort of figuring the way, the sort of sensing out the right way. I think the, uh, uh, another, uh, another big challenge, maybe using that same method, is to take the suburban parts of eastern Reykjavik and try to make them into more of a city, more of a complex drawing from the, the lessons of Jane Jacobs. You know, how can you make, we have the, the residential stock is fine. We don't have to tear down and build from scratch. We can use a lot of what is, almost all of what is there, but it's a question how these things are connected differently, the connection between them, and, and how can we establish a public realm 
improve and, uh, and, 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 and introduce a new public realm that makes all these sort of uh, pieces that were very separated in the 60s and 70s kind of interact into kind of new, new kind of web. Yeah, I wanted to add maybe that, um, you know, I'm a, as I think, uh, as, I saw, as you saw in my lecture, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of the, some of the modernistic buildings. And, uh, but uh, what was not so good in the modernistic period was the understanding of the city environment, especially of the streets, etc. And this idea of the segregation of, of car traffic and pedestrians, etc. Um, they didn't have this rich understanding of what is happening, the complete complexity of life in the streets, which Jane Jacobs understood so well, living in this old part of New York in the 60s. Uh, but I found it very interesting what Augusto was saying about Breitholt, how it was uh, uh, defined. Uh, as a new district with social mixing, uh, with rather uh, low houses, and um, a very green uh, district also. So it reminds a lot of what we are doing today in the city as we are making the city denser. But the big difference is maybe that uh, Breitholt was a completely new district which uh, somehow, in a way, turns its back to the city itself. It is a kind of, it became at least a kind of a gated community, but not a gated community for the rich, rather for the poor. So it wasn't thought in that way, but so it turned out. And I think that is the difference that we have learned, uh, that it is not to build um, good uh, and inexpensive flats with good uh, green public spaces, but it is also very important that, that those districts are really part of the city itself and the street grid. So I think what we have learned today is that um, it is very important that uh, the, the, the street grid uh, is a part of the city. So it is the, this classical uh, street grid. And I think this is uh, maybe the big difference from what we are doing today and from what was done in the 60s, and of course now we know that a good building land is very expensive, very valuable, Therefore, we have to make the city more dense. Again, like Reykjavik used to be in the 30s, uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, a small but very dense city. Yeah, I, I think that Breivald is an excellent example of what was good about modernistic planning, at least. Uh, you can see, if you just look at Reykjavik, there's a kind of pendulum. Uh, in the 1930s, there were the built environment, was very, it was very humanistic in a way. But then after the war, when uh, we are building uh, uh, neighborhoods like Heimar and Hauleite, the connection between the house and the garden and the connection between the house and the surrounding uh, streets is very, it's kind of very clear cut, it's cut off. And people are cut off from the environment. Uh, the houses are very high and the environment is unfriendly. I think the, the most famous example is uh, in Savamiri, that was actually used as a, an example of how terrible modernism could be in an American textbook in the 1970s. But when the, the pendulum, it kind of swung back towards this humanistic modernism in the 1960s and 1970s, and we can see that in Breivold. And I think a, a, many lessons can be learned with modern planning today from the environment we, we can see in Kosovoer, Nedra Breivold and Trönbær, where you build the, the low uh, kind of uh, similar houses that create a, a uniform environment with very good public spaces and uh, uh, and make nice connections to the to the service quarters like schools and shops and 
sports facilities, etc. And I think maybe today we are building, or at least in, not in Reykjavik, but in some surrounding uh, municipalities, we are building a little bit too much like we used to in the 1950s when, when Hawa Leite and Heimar were, yeah. were built. And we're thinking too little about uh, the humanistic values, the, the values for pe the people that live there and their surrounding environment. Yes, I, I think there is, uh, it's int uh, very important if one tends, uh, tries to analyze the urban form of Reykjavik, that there were two, at uh, two points in, in the 20th century, there were uh, major decisions made or influences that, that, that really shaped the, how the city came to be. One was the 1927 plan of Samuelson, which is basically the 101 area of Reykjavik, which was very much influenced by not 19th century planning, but this kind of 20th century garden city idea of low rise, uh, Emma Camelo City and, and uh, Unwin and, and those guys. And it's very interesting that these, uh, these ideas were introduced in Iceland at the same time as Le Corbusier and some other pioneers of later modern planning were looking into, uh, were reading the same books. Now, I think that's very remarkable, and I think it's also very remarkable that when, uh, I think, uh, Gisli Haldorsson, who we are, in a way, celebrating his, his, the birthday of his office today, he, I think he, I'm right to say that he was very instrumental in introducing or picking Peter Bredstorff as a consultant to Reykjavik planning in 1960. And, uh, Presto, as probably all of you know, he was the one who uh, had something to do with the, the finger plan of Copenhagen, the principle of Copenhagen. And uh, I think at the time Presto came to Reykjavik, um, Reykjavik had already built its very first high-rise district, the Heimar Quarter that Augusta was referring to. And uh, in Copenhagen, there had, in, in, after the war, they had built some high-rise district like that, and the experience, sort of negative experience of that kind of modernism had already uh, convinced Peter Bredstorff to seek other solutions. So then again came a new impulse which was kind of revised, and it was not the, the heroic modernism of 1945, it was, or, or, or which, which influenced so much of, of the European cities, it was the revised, uh, rethought, uh, tet and love ideology of the early uh, 60s in, in Denmark. And, and then the fact that what I find very interesting and, and uh, remarkable was what Augusta was pointing out, that Bredstorff was drawing from the earlier garden city planning tradition of, of with, with, by, by referring to the old workers' housing as a prototype for the Nera Bredholt. And I think that's a great tradition that we should continue. <laughs> <laughs> Hjalmar, yeah. Low rise, dense, with, with the improvements that we have learned in the meantime. Yeah, I absolutely do agree with three to uh, five stories. And uh, yeah, I absolutely do agree. I'm sure that um, I was a little bit surprised when Augusta was talking about Sava Mire as, as, as the um, unhumane area, and then Breithold is the prime example of the opposite, um, which I think is, is one of the great things that we can think about or take away from here is that maybe things aren't as obvious, because for me, nostalgia is, is a big part of this. It, it, what we don't fear anymore is a lot easier to live with than what we potentially fear as, or as engulfing us. Um, so we always see that there's, there's this development of, of, there's an element of fear whenever a new style or a new trend comes in. And once it starts to be overtaken by something else, um, it takes a little time, but then we start to appreciate and, 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 and sometimes fall in love with it. And I think that's, that's one of these elements that's, that's uh, tricky, and that's why I maybe raised the question first of the different types of modernism, because some of it is simply older and more easier to fall in love with than some of the more recent ones. So the sort of our immediate history is, is closer tied to some of the, the earlier and the, the newer work, obviously. Um, 
but it's a, it's a tricky, I'm, I'm trying to formulate the question that sort of backed me because I can't avoid thinking about it as in, in the way that if we think about, if we understand the, the emphasis and the values of, of the modernistic style that we're dealing with at each time, which is totally different in, in a building by Manfred and, and or, or a building by Corbusier and then a, then a building by like Lemur, then first of all, we need to understand what is the foundation, what, what like Peter, Peter was talking about, what are the elements that are critical to this building and how do we, how do we emphasize those and the history of those. Um, but that brings me to the second point. There's, there's sort of a matrix of, of, first of all, we have the different styles across horizontally, or what we, we want to call it, and then the ideas that, that Peter brought up with, with my history, your history, our history. How do, we, how do we understand the different historic layers that then come in from the different players? Who are we conserving for and why are we conserving it? And that that kind of matrix is maybe something that, that starts to get close to the, some of the theory that you were, you were explaining to us um, earlier. Yes, um, I think a big part of it is that, um, as was mentioned here uh, in the beginning, that um, the complexity has increased quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. since uh, the roof of the modernistic era. Um, and that is uh, maybe one of the reasons for these uh, housing projects that uh, for some reason we find it a little bit difficult to love them and uh, for another reason they are a very big part of, it, uh, part of us and they are a, a quite, uh, you could say, intelligent answer of a modern way of living. Uh, but when it comes to an architectural value, of course, uh, Villa Savoir or whatever uh, we have of a uh, monument uh, that reminds us of, of some of the essential part of the modernism is, is very um, direct to fall in love with. But it's also, you must remember, that it's made on a very, very simple program. Um, and um, where we are heading uh, today, uh, complexity just increases. And um, if you work with an architectural practice today, um, the real challenge is in the programs, is in the brief, and it is about how can you combine different aspects of function. And that goes in every scale that is within uh, city planning or whatever function uh, that you have as a, as a building. It is all about combination. Um, so, so that is, uh, and that uh, goes back to the, the main question about the the social life, and uh, how that has changed. Uh, and then, of, of course, you can say this sustainable thing. Yes, okay, that could be one concept, but maybe uh, you could say the uh, the social aspect of sustainability, or just as a way of living, is uh, is what we have to deal with. And uh, when it comes to in, in, an architectural uh, approach. Uh, then you can, s uh, and some of the good things that we have from the modernistic area um, can be hard to find sometimes. Uh, if we should uh, have a friendly um, thought to, um, to out of laws, then you can say that the, uh, the uh, what, what he said ab about, uh, about this uh, pattern, uh, that is uh, long, long back in, in architecture, and uh, we, I think we have to remind ourselves of some of the, uh, the basic ideas and this revolution of a new kind of life. Maybe that was the good thing about uh, the modernistic area. Uh, and it, it was the last time that we really saw a change that affected the way of living deeply. Maybe what we experience today is just a small scratch in the surface. Yeah, well, I think that we have now, uh, we are now living in a very interesting area because you, um, I think that you can uh, say that the area between 1970 and maybe 2000 uh, was not such a good area for the cities because many people wanted to get out of the centers at least, out of the suburbs. It was the case here at least in, in Reykjavik and, and many other cities, but now we have this, what is called this urban renaissance and uh, new urbanism and whatever you call it. And uh, 
uh, although some of uh, some of it might be rather superficial, but uh, it is a very interesting turn to the city again. And we see it by younger generations, here in Reykjavik as elsewhere, that they kind of love the urban environment. And uh, I read two or three years ago um, a book by a German, uh, a German journalist, uh, which is called Wir sind die Stadt, We are the city. And he's, he is analyzing exactly this, uh, this movement to the city again. And, and the values uh, that the, a good city environment has. And there, of course, uh, most valuable, the public spaces, also the restaurants, the coffees, etc. And he's pointing out that um, um, one of the big problems in our societies, one of the big health problems is loneliness, because there are so many single people, so many young single people, for example, and maybe 15 years ago, uh, many thought that people wouldn't be going to work anymore because everybody would be s sitting home working on the computer. But that turned out to be not so good idea because life being alone in your flat becomes very lonely and very boring. And he is saying that this digital uh, revolution uh, does not uh, le lead to, uh, to, a, to a situation where, you don't, uh, where people are not coming to uh, public places anymore. It is exactly the reverse. People, uh, younger generation, uh, sitting at their computers every day, they have to meet other people. And exactly therefore, uh, public places, uh, big and small squares, public gardens and coffees and restaurants uh, downtown are becoming so popular. Um, so I found that a very interesting analyze that uh, the digital revolution has helped us in uh, revitalizing the cities again which was not what was expected some uh, couple of years ago. Yeah, exactly.